and welcome to our very first video lecture for the new IB Chemistry Syllabus. Our guiding question for this video lecture, how can we model the particulate nature of matter? These are our content statements that are going to be included in today's lecture. If you want to read them, feel free to pause the video and read. Otherwise, here we go. Our objectives for today, we're going to do lots of review of intro chem. We're going to define element compound mixture, talk about methods for separating mixtures. We're going to review phase changes and then describe the energy changes that we can diagram in heating curves. And some vocab review. Remember that elements are the simplest of our pure substances. They can neither be broken down chemically nor physically. They are composed of atoms. Atoms are the smallest pieces of elements. Compounds are composed of molecules. Now I have atoms of different elements that are chemically bonded to each other. In these super cool fixed ratios, that means that the proportions of the different kinds of atoms are going to stay the same. Water is always two hydrogens to one oxygen every single time. If I have something different, a different ratio like this one, H2O2, now I have hydrogen peroxide, which is not the same compound as water mixtures. Now I just have stuff kind of sitting next to each other. So we can have multiple elements and or compounds. No fixed ratio. They're just kind of hanging out so they're not chemically bonded to each other. Mixtures can be either homogeneous or heterogeneous. So homogeneous mixture, something like a sample of salt water, where every scoop of salt water that I take out of this particular sample is going to be the same as all the other scoops that I take out of this particular sample. Heterogeneous mixtures do not have a uniform composition. We're talking about something like chicken noodle soup, where I could have all kinds of things. Um, I could have a scoop that has some noodles. I could have a scoop that has some chicken, perhaps some celery or carrots, depending on what you put in your chicken noodle soup. So very different scoops coming out of this heterogeneous mixture. Here's a fun thing. Did you know that elements and compounds can also be homogeneous or heterogeneous? Think about ice water. If I've got ice water, it's all a compound. It's all H2O, but it is not homogeneous because I've got some solid chunks and I've got some liquid pieces. Not the same, not uniform throughout. Crazy, right? And our solutions are all homogeneous mixtures. All solutions are homogeneous mixtures. And what's pretty cool about solutions is that they have a solute and a solvent. The solvent is the thing that does the dissolving in that solution. And then the solute is the thing that is dissolved in the solvent. If we're talking about salt water. Um, of course, our salt is going to be the solute and water is going to be the solvent. Water is such a common solvent that we actually have a state symbol for it. So if I'm talking about sodium chloride, which is common table salt. Um, this is the chemical formula for sodium chloride. If I put AQ in parentheses after salt, this is telling all of the world that our salt is dissolved in water. This stands for aqueous, aqueous solution um, of sodium chloride. So salt dissolved in water is NaCl AQ, that state symbol for aqueous. Kind of cool, another solution that's really common in the world um, is the air that we breathe. And the solvent is actually nitrogen gas. Nitrogen gas is the most abundant of the gases in the air that we breathe here on Earth. Um, the solutes are all the other gases that are dissolved in that nitrogen, so oxygen and carbon dioxide. Probably some really bad stuff like probably some ozone, maybe some carbon monoxide, some nitrogen dioxide. Hopefully not too much of these guys where we're breathing but those um, oxygen, carbon dioxide, super common. But the most abundant of the gases that we breathe is nitrogen. It just goes in our lungs and right back out. One of the things that we like to do in chemistry is to separate our mixtures, to isolate or purify those different substances. How we choose our technique is we think about the properties of the components of our mixture. If I have something that has different solubilities, for example, I went to the beach and I scooped up some salty sand and I wanted to separate the salt from the sand, I would use their solubility differences to do that. I could add some water that would cause the salt to dissolve 
the sand would not because they have different solubilities. I can then filter out the sand. My sand is going to get stuck here in the filter paper in the funnel. Sand will get stuck here. The salt water will pass through the filter paper is going to be here in the filtrate. I can then allow the water to evaporate away from the salt and I will have the recrystallization of my salt and then I would have salt and I would have sand. We can also distill substances, mixtures, in order to separate their components. And distillation is based on different boiling points of our substances. I could take that same salt water and put it here in my distillation flask, heat it up. The water has a lower boiling point than does the salt. So the water will evaporate um, with that increase in heat. The water is going to, the water vapor is going to be directed um, through the in inner tube of the condenser, I'm going to add water, cold water from the sink, and it's going to circulate around the water vapor on the inside of my condenser. And that's going to cause, you guessed it, the water vapor to condense back to liquid. And then we can capture it here um, at the end of the condenser and then distill it. We could also separate um, solutions of different liquids using distillation. Let's say that I had, instead of salt water, maybe I had some alcohol and water. Alcohol has a lower boiling point than does water. So the alcohol would evaporate first. We would capture that vapor here in the inner tube of the condenser, cool it off in the outer tube, capture our alcohol here and the at the end of the condenser. Um, I would add a thermometer or a temperature probe to watch to see when the temperatures start to change. I could either turn it off before the water starts to evaporate, or I could move that beaker away and put in the next beaker for the next substance's boiling point. So um, the first thing to pop out is going to be thing with the lowest boiling point and then next and next and next. We can also use magnets, which is super fun. You may have done this back in elementary school, uh, where you just take some breakfast cereal, which is fortified with iron, lots and lots of iron. Um, and you can actually mash it up and then use a magnet to separate the iron from the rest of the cereal. So that one's kind of fun. And then chromatography is another way that we can separate components um, based on this idea of adsorption. So adsorption is the tendency of solid substances. So solids are going to attract to their surfaces molecules of liquids and or gases. And the force of attraction is going to be different, usually based on polarity. So these forces of attractions between molecules or, or forces of repulsion um, are going to lead to the separation of these components in our mixture. So here we have some um, some chromatography tubes. So we've added our, our um, adsorption substance here. We're going to add a solvent. We're going to add our mixture. And then as the solution here passes through the tube, through the column, we're going to separate the components of the mixture. So depending on the polarity of our substances of our solvent, we're going to have some things pass through first, later things pass through later. It's pretty cool. We're going to do this in lab. I mentioned a few slides ago the state symbol AQ, which stands for aqueous. It means that a substance is dissolved in water. We have other state symbols for the other states of matter. Solid, we use S. Liquid, we use L. Gaseous, we use G. Plasma, plasma we can use P, but usually plasma is not included in a chemical equation, so it's not often that we would actually need to write that P for plasma. Solids have the lowest energy um, of these different states of matter. They have so little energy that their interparticle forces, interparticle forces, actually hold those different particles together. If I add energy, more energy, more energy, these guys start to wiggle and jiggle away from each other, and then we get a liquid. 
if we add more and more energy, we're going to end up now with gases. Notice that there is separation um, between the particles of the gas. They have so much energy, they don't stick together at all anymore. And then if we add energy to our gases, these guys actually start to pop apart. So our atoms actually separate and we end up with some excited molecules and we have um, electrons and we have ions and plasma is weird and cool. Um, it's northern lights and it's lightning and all kinds of other cool stuff. Um, again, what state of matter substances are in is going to depend on the interplay between those interparticle forces. How sticky are those molecules to each other? And then also the energy that they have. The more kinetic energy we have, the more they move, the less likely they are to be solid and then a liquid and then a gas. We can change our states of matter by adding or taking away energy. Um, if I have this solid and I add energy, again, it's going to be converted into a liquid. We call that melting. It is reversible, though. I can take energy away from the liquid and it will go back to freezing um, to a solid. We can add heat to our liquids, evaporate to gases. We can cool off our gases and condense back to liquids. If we play with the pressure in addition to the temperature, we can also skip liquids entirely. We can go exactly uh, um, back and forth between solids and gases. So from a solid to a gas, this is known as sublimation. The most common example that we have is dry ice. Dry ice is actually frozen carbon dioxide. Um, and at Earth's pressure, it actually doesn't go through a melting stage to a gaseous stage. It gets to skip straight to gaseous CO2. Um, and we're going to call that sublimation. If I want to make some dry ice from carbon dioxide, that's known as a deposition. So going straight from a, from, ooh, from a gas, sorry, from a gas all the way to a solid, skipping that liquid phase, that's known as deposition. All of these are reversible um, and all of them, again, depend on the amount of energy that is um, being added to a substance. We can actually diagram those phase changes with super cool heating curves. This graph is showing us on the x-axis time. We're going to assume that there is a constant input of heat over time. And then we also have on our y-axis temperature. We've got here some ice, our solid water. It is getting warmer, warmer, warmer until we get to the melting point of ice. And then the temperature doesn't change anymore which is weird because we're still adding heat. But what's happening instead of changing the temperature of this water, this H2O, we're now converting it from a solid to a liquid. This is melting. So we need to add energy to convert from solid to liquid. But because we're changing the potential energy, woo, the position of those molecules of water, we don't have an increase in temperature because temperature is related to kinetic energy. Once I have all that water, all of my ice is melted. Now I have this liquid water. I've got an increase in kinetic energy as we're adding heat. And that continues until we get to, you guessed it, the boiling point of water. At this point, again, we're going to have no increase in temperature because we have instead an increase in potential energy. Kinetic energy is related to temperature. Potential energy is related to position. And so now I'm changing the position of the molecules from liquids to gases. But once I have all of my liquid, I've got some liquid and some gas, some liquid and some gas, some liquid and some gas. Once I have all gases, now I can start to, again, increase the kinetic energy, the temperature of my sample because I don't have to change the position anymore because everything is now a gas. In chemistry, when we are talking about temperature, the best scale to use is actually Kelvin. This is given to us in our data booklets, um, section for unit conversions and standard conditions. Um, but also, it's not that hard to memorize this number. So maybe put into your brain somewhere that when I want to convert from Celsius to Kelvin, all I have to do is add 273. So my zero degrees Celsius, zero Celsius plus 273.15 is going to give us 273.15 Kelvin. There's no degree Kelvin, it's just Kelvin. We actually like to use Kelvin because absolute zero is actually zero Kelvin. When we're talking about temperature, we're talking about average kinetic energy of the molecules in a sample. 
If something has zero energy, there is no energy, right? Uh, nothing can have negative amounts of energy. So uh, if I'm talking about something that has a temperature of negative 50 degrees Celsius, that makes sense because it's colder than the freezing point of water. But if I'm talking about temperature in terms of kinetic energy, negative 50 doesn't make any sense because how can something have negative 50 units of energy? That doesn't make any sense. And so we have Kelvin because there is no negative Kelvin. Zero Kelvin is literally zero energy. It is absolute zero. Um, and so for us, Kelvin is a little better. Uh, it helps us with our calculations for sure, for sure. We talk about gas law chemistry when we get to our stoichiometry unit. Oh, friends, all Kelvin all the time. Um, and again, how do we convert from Celsius to Kelvin? We're going to add 273.15. And just like that, my friends, we have reached the end of our very first video lecture for the new IB chemistry syllabus. We defined element compound mixture. We talked about how we can separate mixtures. It's going to depend on the properties of the components of the mixture. We talked about those phase changes, how we go from solid to liquid to gas and back. And sometimes we can skip from solid to gas or from gas to solid. We talked about the energy changes that are diagrammed in heating curves and how we can change kinetic energy and then potential energy and then kinetic energy and then potential energy and then kinetic energy again. Great work today.